While much of film analysis comes down to subjectivity, there are a few objective truths. Continuity errors, bad lighting, a boom mic, a crew operator, or maybe a Starbucks cup and frame are obviously mistakes. There's little debating that. However, past those few technical aspects, what's considered quality just comes down to preference. And it's the consensus that dictates the way that films are remembered culturally. Sometimes, mediocre films come along that are loved by all. Others are appreciated on release, but become lost to the sands of time. Sometimes the consensus gets it right. Other times, we get it wrong. Look at a movie like The Thing. On, on its initial release, it was panned by critics, but now it's seen as a masterpiece. Did you know that critics originally disliked Empire Strikes Back? Yeah, now it's widely regarded as the best movie in that ultimately mediocre franchise. And the list doesn't stop there either. Movies like Blade Runner, Fight Club, and even The Shining were so outside the box that critics didn't really know what to think of them. But as the world changes, so does the way we view it. Through this context, we have the opportunity to reappraise the art of our past through a new lens. This series exists to take another look at popular films that divided critics and audiences and decide for myself, once and for all, is it terrible? On this particular video, we're going to talk a little bit about the ultimate clash of the slashers with 2003's Freddy vs. Jason. There's no genre that's more synonymous with the 1980s than the slasher film. Unsupervised teens, unstoppable masked murderer, the final girl. Look, I know you already know this stuff, I'm just laying some pipe here. If you don't, or you just want to learn more, be sure to check out the slashers episode of Movie Monsters, I'll post a link in the description. But since you're here now, let me just get to it. John Carpenter's Halloween made a shitload of money and producer Sean Cunningham took note. He scrambled immediately to find another ominous holiday to turn into a horror series and settled on the unluckiest day of the year, Friday the 13th. And in 1980, the movie hit theaters and profoundly changed the entertainment landscape of the decade. Gone were the days of the exploitation genre, now replaced by movies that embody the excess of the 80s. As you'll remember from the original film, or a conversation with Ghostface, the movie's missing its main ingredient. It was really when Jason showed up in Friday the 13th 3D that the franchise exploded in popularity. In fact, it could be argued that this is the defining franchise of the 1980s. But I guess the same could actually be said about A Nightmare on Elm Street. Toasty! Legendary horror filmmaker Wes Craven, who'd previously worked with Cunningham on The Last House on the Left, saw an opportunity to leave his own mark on the genre. And in 1984, A Nightmare on Elm Street was unleashed on audiences. Craven has said that the inspiration was articles that he'd read about otherwise healthy men that were dying in their sleep for no apparent reason. He expanded on this idea and created a monster straight out of our nightmares. In a way, A Nightmare on Elm Street was the answer to the slasher genre shortcomings. Like, why are the female characters always falling down in Friday the 13th? Perhaps it symbolically represents that death is inevitable no matter how hard we try to escape it, but for some reason I doubt it. The kids in a nightmare aren't idiots, but you can't outrun sleep. As with the Gen X rivalry between Coke and Pepsi or Nintendo and Sega, many debated the better baddie, Jason or Freddy. If they faced off, I always believed Freddy would be the hands down victor. I mean, he's not bound to the physics of our reality. Anyhow, both had reached remarkable commercial success, launching merchandise and even their own respective television series. Yeah, all, all kinds of merchandise. Matter of fact, Freddie was the lead singer in a group called the Elm Street Group, and they released a Greatest Hits album, and I gotta tell you guys, every single song on it is a bop, so uh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll really enjoy that. In 1987, New Line and Paramount began working to create a Freddy vs. Jason movie, but they weren't able to reach a deal. After a while, the slasher era began to fizzle. The screams turned to whispers, and at the end of the 1980s, the sun had seemingly set, and now there were barely murmurs of Freddy or Jason. It was when New Line Cinemas acquired the rights to Friday the 13th that fans got their first official tease. The last shot of 1993's Jason Goes to Hell features Freddy's knife glove bursting through the dirt like a zombie and grabbing Jason's hockey mask and dragging it to what was in retrospect clearly development hell because it was still going to be another 10 years before the title fight. But from time to time I still wondered, if Freddy and Jason were actually to fight each other in a movie, who would win? 
do you decide according to how many millions of dollars the characters grossed in the box office? Because if that's the case, Jason's your winner hands down. I know that if it were me, I always thought you'd have to decide which of these two the audience would root for. Who has the most tragic backstory? The disabled kid that was bullied, neglected, and left to die, or the, uh, you know, the pervert? In August 2003, on Friday the, the 15th? Okay. Freddy vs. Jason was released in theaters by New Line Cinemas. Directing duties for the film went to the director of Jet Li's Fearless, as well as the horror comedy Bride of Chucky, Ronnie Yu. And writing credits went to Swift and Shannon, who were the duo responsible for the 2009 Friday the 13th. The movie grossed over $116 million off a $25 million budget, which is not too shabby. I remember going and seeing it on opening night in a little movie theater that was called The Silver Screen. It was the perfect venue for cult horror movies. That said, 2003 wasn't exactly 1985 in the types of movies that were driving audiences to theaters, but because this was a niche theater that held screenings of movies like the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the audience that I saw it with was an enthusiastic one. We were all excited and sort of nostalgic to see our favorite teen murderers from the 80s that weren't Ted Bundy finally face off. While this wasn't the first time that Marky Monsters had battled on the big screen, it had been decades since the release of Frankenstein meets the Wolfman or King Kong vs. Godzilla. Seriously, this was a cultural moment for Gen Xers and old millennials like myself. Sadly, it just happened 15 years too late. But that said, the marketing team did have some clever ideas to help build the anticipation, including this boxing style Vegas weigh-in, but was the effort too little too late? The film has the notably divisive critic score of 41% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the audience score being exactly a 50%. Oh, you're, you're not a Rotten Tomatoes fan. Okay, well, it's got a similar 5.7 on IMDb. And I'm gonna be honest, I actually haven't seen this movie since it came out, so first things first, let's watch Freddy vs. Jason. In Freddy vs. Jason, Freddy uses his dream powers and Jason's devotion to his dear sweet mommy to manipulate Jason into going on a killing spree in Springwood, aka the home of the infamous Elm Street. He hopes that Jason's reign of terror will restore the town's fear of him and in turn restore his diminished power so that he can get back to killing. The thing is, as the bodies start piling up, Freddy decides that he doesn't like sharing the spotlight and decides that Jason's become a liability. All of this is nicely recapped in the beginning with a bit of Fred's position in which Freddy catches up the audience through voiceover and metatextually muses on the fact that audiences have mostly turned away from this sort of entertainment. Meanwhile, the kids of Elm Street start uncovering the truth about the town's past, and in a Hail Mary attempt to stop the massacre, they decide that the only way to stop an unstoppable force is with an immovable object. Something like that. That's the basic plot, and I gotta tell you, if I were gonna set the stage for a crossover between these two, this is the way i do it. Let's be real right up front though, this is not exactly a movie that's standing in the shadows of greatness. I mean, as much as I love the slasher genre, it's not exactly high art. More like art that you watch high, you know what I mean? All I'm concerned with is how does this movie stack up against the rest? I mean, I feel it would be a little unfair to hold it to a higher standard than the series that it's based on. The cast includes notable actresses Monica Kina, who was an entourage, Catherine Isabella from Ginger Snaps, and Kelly Rollins, possibly remembered from being a part of that group that Beyonce was in. But let's see if she can act. Freddy! What kind of faggot runs around in a Christmas sweater? Come on, get real. You're not even scary. I'm not even scary. I'm not even scary. And let's talk about the butter knives. What is with the butter knives? You trying to compensate for something? Yeah, uh, wow. That, that didn't age well at all. As you can tell, the performances aren't great. The characters are extremely thinly written and the script certainly doesn't do them any favors. But is the cast better than your typical cast of slasher movie characters? Maybe, but just a little bit. But what about the performances that matter? I mean, really, who, who gives a shit about these teens past how good their asses look or how good they can scream? Let's talk about the real leads. 
At 6'5", Ken Kersinger is the tallest actor to ever portray Jason. It's that hulking stature that caused him to be able to edge out fan favorite Kane Hodder. And Kersinger's performance feels authentic. He's one of the most imposing Jasons of all time, while also being one of the most sympathetic. And Freddy? Robert England dons the fedora and the glove for the last time. Well, outside of an appearance on that 80s set TV series, The Goldbergs. In 03, Robert England was 55 years old, but the role did still fit like a knifed glove. This is Freddy, and no one could do it better. The original A Nightmare on Elm Street had a budget of under $2 million. The original Friday the 13th, under a million. Freddy vs. Jason, $25 million. Now, I don't know much about inflation, but $25 million sounds like, uh, two, three, sounds like a lot more money. But is it well spent? Well, yeah. The scale is much larger, and there's a few great sets, including the boiler room, a construction site, and Jason's lair at Camp Crystal Lake, where we get one of the film's only truly haunting and artistic moments. It's a look inside Jason's disturbed mind and at his vast collection of victims throughout the years. Freddy's makeup is a slight update on the classic look, uh, this time with deeper, more pronounced scarring, at least it, it looked that way to me. It's a strong take, even if the latex seems a little too thick this time. As I mentioned earlier, Jason is huge, and his skin is like dark from decay. His head's bald except for stringy random patches, and when the mask comes off this time, it's appropriately gross. And it's not goofy like some of the other reveals. Yeah, all the practical effects look great. And this is where the budget really did come in handy. Building on decades of ingenuity from makeup mavericks like Tom Savini, Rob Botton creates some really gnarly kills here, including this gym. Thing is, while the techniques are more refined, they do lack the DIY spirit of the predecessors. And sadly, there is an over-reliance on some very shitty CGI. It's distractingly bad at times, even though I do kind of like the Freda pillar that gets high with the discount Jason Muse. What's worse, though, than the dated CGI is the dated new Metal, which ironically is old and about as relevant as Kelly Rollins. Imagine if the movie would have come out in 1990. How much different would the reaction have been prior to the release of Wes Craven's Scream, which is the movie that essentially drove a death knell into the coffin of this entire era? It was really hard to take slasher films serious after this. So, in some ways, Freddy vs. Jason's a movie that was released well after its expiration date. It aimed to capture the nostalgia of those of us that grew up on the slasher films of yore, and in some ways, it succeeds. It brings back the titular characters in a setup that makes sense within the context of their lore. I mean, how else would Freddy get to Jason but by impersonating Pamela Voorhees in a series of nightmares nagging him? <laughs> it's, it's just classic Freddy. Structurally, it splits the difference between the two franchises and has nice callbacks to both, but it does fall more on the side of being a nightmare movie with Freddy as the antagonist and Jason ultimately becoming the film's anti-hero. We see Elm Street, dream sequences, Jason's mother, Crystal Lake, and other iconography from the series, including plenty of cheesy humor that you either love or hate about the Nightmare sequels. And Jason goes hard in this movie. He's just framed like a total badass, and every time he shows up, he's accompanied by heavy metal music. We see more of his backstory in this film than most of the previous movies, and we get to see inside his mind and learn what makes him tick. And we get to see him go postal at this kegger in a cornfield and take out more victims at once than any of his previous movies. It was clear to me for the first time that Jason's the fan favorite. Much like in the original A Nightmare on Elm Street, in the final act, Freddy's brought to the real world to square off. Only this time, it's not against a little girl. It's against Jason. And it's a moment of pure catharsis. But... In my opinion, the biggest problem with this movie is that it kind of feels like a live-action Looney Tunes cartoon. I understand that you'd have to make this post-scream slasher versus movie with a sense of self-awareness, but the decision to make Freddy Krueger Bugs Bunny just really doesn't sit. In Freddy's world, he should have unlimited power. He should be able to punch Jason clear across the room, and that tracks. But in the real world, he should have the power of a man, but time after time, he bests Jason with these ridiculous tactics like launching compressed air torpedoes, although I did kind of like the rebar bit. But the lack of distinction between the dream world and the film's reality make the nightmare sequences seem less fantastical, and the reality sequences seem less grounded. Plus, when they fight, 
it's very clearly a 55 year old man up against a mountain and that little glove just doesn't seem all that threatening or effective because like they always say you never bring a knife to a machete fight and that's the inherent issue with Freddy vs. Jason as a movie in general, is that they eventually have to fight each other, and that's just ridiculous no matter how you slice it. I would have been fine with a versus movie that didn't include a physical altercation between the two, but I suspect that audiences would have streaked their juggalo makeup through tears of disappointment. So is it terrible? This may shock you, but I'm gonna go no on this one. I mean, is it great? Nah, but it doesn't take away from what came before it, and I feel it mostly delivers on the premise. If you take the best Friday sequel, and the best Elm Street sequel, and you mash them together, this is what you'd get, only with all around better production. It carries on most of the tradition of the slasher film, for better or worse, and it adds in some WWE energy for good measure. It does have an attractive cast, crazy high body count even for this sort of thing, some good kills and practical effects, buckets of blood, and solid performances from the marquee monsters. Seriously, Jason has seldom been better if ever, and the film served to humanize the character and accomplishes it while settling the debate once and for all. Sort of. It's dumb, but it knows it, even embraces it. But what about us? What did we expect from a movie called Freddy vs. Jason? At least the movie knows what it is. So embrace it or not, it's the movie we asked for and it's the movie we deserved. But where do you stand on Freddy vs. Jason? Let's discuss below. Thank you guys so much for stopping by to check out this episode of Is It Terrible? If you enjoyed it, do me a favor, take a second to click that little thumbs up button down there. And if you want to check out more content, then all you got to do is subscribe. I'll leave a link below to the Slashers episode of Movie Monsters, as well as the Mortal Kombat episode of Is It Terrible? Thank you again, and until next time, I'm Jeremy. Be terrible. Uh.